Welcome back, geologists, for part two of the Cambrian period. We'll be examining the life forms that appeared during the early, middle, and late Cambrian periods. And the discussion must start off with the most famous fossil in the rock record called a trilobite. Tri means three, and lobe or lobus means the actual lobe of the body, so this part of the body right here. So there are three segments to the animal. We'll talk a little bit more about it. But their name really comes from the th three lobes that they have on their thorax, not just the three major sections of them. They are an extinct class of arthropods, so they're distantly related to something like a roach. That may change your perception of them, but don't let it because trilobites are enduring. There are no more of them in the rock record. They're extremely special. Another thing to consider is there were over 15,000 different species of trilobites described, of which many appear during the Cambrian period, and I might add also went extinct in the Cambrian period. So let me be sure to clarify that trilobites survived until the end of the Permian where they finally went extinct in the worst mass extinction event of geologic time. But they had a very, very strong start with a massive reduction in families and species at the end of the Cambrian period. These animals are extremely valuable for indexing as an index fossil because they're widespread in occurrence on every continent just about and they lived in massive numbers, quantities, and different species. So they were very recognizable for a specific window of time, making them meet all the right requirements for being an index fossil. They were solely marine animals, so what did they do? Most of them were bottom dwellers that were sca scavengers. There were some that were a few swimmers and a handful that could have been predators, but most of them were just doing their thing, scavenging at the bottom of the ocean floor, looking for leftovers of detrital material or organic material that they would have consumed, much like a roach would do today. Their bodies are divided into three different parts. The cephalon, which is this part up here, the head, the thorax is this major section right here, and the pygidium is this section right down here, which is its tail. So people think the three parts is this, this, and this. Well, the three parts actually are related to this section in here of how the thorax is divided. Trilobites, in most cases, are tiny, uh, but there are some that are really little bitty, smaller than a penny in size, and then there are some that are as large as almost two feet tall. But the average one is between three centimeters to 10 centimeters. So you're looking at the average size about this right here, or maybe even slightly bigger. Anyhow, the biggest species of trilobites actually existed in the Devonian period, and it's kind of an anomaly. They just appeared and got back to normal size after the Devonian until they went extinct at the end of the Permian. Most trilobites had eyes, and they have a place for an eye socket, for example, right here. There were several species that were blind that didn't need it. They were burrowers. But most of them did develop an eyes, and that was probably an adaption for needing to look for predators and for looking for their own food resource. Something you should know about trilobites, very, very successful group of invertebrates that made such a strong appearance at the beginning of the Cambrian and did really well through the Cambrian, but took a serious, serious hit at the end of the Cambrian period. 75% loss to be exact. They would take another hit at the end of the Ordovician, dropping substantially by numbers again. If that wasn't enough, they took a third blow at the end of the Devonian, and then they finally get wiped out at the end of the Permian. Pretty enduring little animals, though, in terms of what they did and where they lived. They had a great eco ecological niche that they filled. Mollusk appeared during the early Cambrian. 
Mollusks can include things such as bivalves and gastropods. There are some non-coiling cephalopods even that appear during this time frame. Most of these animals would have lived in shallow marine uh, environments and even subtidal environments where you would go to pick up seashells today. These left an excellent marker in the rock record from the Cambrian all the way to the present. Some shelly animals really haven't changed that much from the Cambrian. Others have changed dramatically. There are some that we no longer have that almost look like they're experiments from way back when in the early Paleozoic. But we know that the earliest fossil of mollusks appear in the early Cambrian period. Brachiopods make their debut in the early Cambrian period. Brachiopods may look like mollusks, but do not confuse them. They are different. There's some very strong similarities, but unique differences that separate brachiopods from mollusks. We'll be looking at them more closely in Ordovician, so stay tuned. Essentially, these were very primitive brachiopods that existed during the early Cambrian, inarticulate to be exact. So these guys lacked a special tooth and socket arrangement that is the hinge of where the two shells would fit together and they pivot. They didn't have that where articulated brachiopods did. So when we look at inarticulate versus articulate brachiopods, they are simply divided based on how that hinge is put together. So if they have the hinge that has that tooth socket together, then they will open and close, and most of the time their shells are found together. Regardless, what we had in the early Cambrian was primarily inarticulate. If we had any articulated, they would have been the very primitive versions of those. In either case, brachiopods are suspension feeders, and they're kind of neat animals because they figured out a way to suspend themselves a little bit above the seafloor. While there's some that were bottom dwellers completely in terms of attached to the bottom, they didn't, uh, they didn't have anything to rise them up. Most of them had this uh, pedicle that allowed them to kind of sit taller above everybody else, kind of, I think, a smart evolutionary development, of which they still have today. We get our first primitive echinoderms. While this may look like a crinoid, they are not, uh, they are the most primitive versions of crinoids. So it's not officially correct anyhow to say that crinoids appear during the Cambrian. What you can say is eocrinoids appear during the Cambrian, which are very primitive versions of these types of filter feeders. So these are brachials right here, these things that are twisted, and not all versions have this, but they have a similar body plan where they have a stem made up of little columns, and then they have a calyx here, and then they have these brachials, which are their filter feeding apparatuses. So you'll see more echinoderms starting in the Ordovician, but we get our first one in the Cambrian, early Cambrian specifically. Another famous animal, and I'm going to say very famous because it made its debut and it went belly up, fully extinct in the same geologic period. Archaeocyathids are these little guys. They're sometimes given the common name ancient cups. But these interesting guys uh, are kind of related to sponges. And they inhabited coastal areas that were shallow marine environments. We had them all over the place during the Cambrian period. Literally over a hundred families evolved very, very quickly. Unfortunately, they didn't do so well and went extinct at the end of the Cambrian period along with most of the trilobites. So we're gonna shift gears and move into the middle Cambrian. Why is this such a big deal? Well, the middle Cambrian represents this time where we had some very unique organisms evolve, and we have a record of it that we really shouldn't. Some of these animals were soft-bodied. So here, let's talk about it. We got a, a sea level drop during the salt sea as it was transgressing. It had uh, minor transgressive regressive sequences in between the full beginning and end cycle of the sequence. What we know is during the middle Cambrian that metazoans rapidly evolved. And this increased the numbers, varieties, body plan types, and so forth that existed during the Cambrian. So what is a metazoan? These are animals that are multicellular and 
contain mitochondrial DNA. So they're eukaryotes is what they are. And these animals have very specialized functions. Something else to note in the Middle Cambrian, we had large carnivores appear in the marine environment. Just to be clear, there are no animals on land yet. So don't be thinking about anything on land. There's no plants, there's no animals. Everything's in the ocean at this time. So we're strictly talking marine. So we can't have a discussion about the Middle Cambrian without bringing up the Burgess Shale. Charles Doolittle Walcott discovered this in 1909, and it may be one of the most important fossil discoveries of all time, and here's why. It preserved animals that lived in a shallow marine environment. When you're like, that's no big deal. Yeah, well, it kind of is, and here's why. It did because these animals, many of them were soft-bodied, so it, told, it gave us a glimpse into the fact that while we had all these blossoming, shelly animals diversifying really rapidly, we had a whole fauna of soft-bodied animals that we don't have a good rock record for. And we got a glimpse into that. That's part of the missing stuff that's in the rock record that we talked about in fossils. You don't get to bury every animal and fossilize every animal that lives. So the Middle Burgess represents this time that helped piece together one of the most critically important diversification events in the history of animals. And it represented the Cambrian explosion. So this is a Lagerstatin site. It's so critically important because it preserved these animals almost perfectly where it really shouldn't have. So let's talk about this and show you where in the, it's located and what it is. First of all, it's located out near um, British Columbia, and you're looking at a middle Cambrian rock deposit. These are stromatoporid type algal reefs right here. And what would happen is there would be animals living here and there would be animals living down at the base of these algal reefs. Be clear, we did not have coral reefs yet. Nevertheless, these animals uh, got buried for a couple of reasons. One, they could have had turbidity currents that came through that washed down the continental shelf and then down the continental slope right here and buried them alive with turbidity currents. Second of all, you could have had mass wasting events. That large section of this would have broken off and buried them instantaneously. Regardless of the circumstance, we can learn a lot about what happened to these animals simply by looking at the sediments and then certainly learn about the ecosystem by looking at the fossils, which were the animals that lived during that time. So these animals lived in a shallow marine continental shelf environment and then they were literally buried alive. So that's very kind of sad for them but the instantaneous burial is what missed the magic behind finding the Burgess Shale and being able to identify the animals that are in there. I'm only going to touch on a handful of the famous animals that make up the Burgess Shale but each one of them is unique and important to the story of the Middle Cambrian fauna. Trilobites are one of the most common fossils that you'll find in the Burgess Shale. Not a surprise considering they were radiating in all places of the world. Morella is another famous one. This is probably the most common fossil uh, in addition to trilobites, even more common than trilobites to be honest. These guys are pretty small, less than two centimeters. They may look like a trilobite, but they, they are not. They had a big shield on their head similar to how a trilobite has the, the top of their, their head, their cephalon, but they've got these tentacles and these radiating shield parts that come off, and they've got segments, different lots of segments and different body parts than what a trilobite would do. So we know that they had a lot of legs, and we had some pretty good fossil record of Morella. So Morella is the most common of the Burgess Shale fossils. Here is a Morella fossil, and this is the soft-bodied section like the legs. You don't usually get that in the fossil record. So the Burgess Shale preserved details of animals that we don't normally have unless we have living versions of the same thing. Wapita, fascinating guy. We have versions similar to this guy today, so we don't have uh, really good 
pictures to show you that would show you the size and shape of these things. So I went with one of the modern types of organisms that's similar to Wapita today. These guys were arthropods that were foragers, moved along the ocean floor, and they had a very elongated body like these guys right here. And we actually have fossil records that have their entire fossils that look just like this in the Burgess Shale. So one of the famous predators from the Burgess Shale is the Opabinia. And this guy had five eyes on the top of his head, this feeding apparatus right here, this thing that came out with these clinchers and flaps that allowed him to propel through water to catch his prey. Now he was primarily a bottom dweller, lived on the seabed, but he would wait for things to come by to eat and then run and get them and bring them in. This is what we think he looked like. He wasn't very big in comparison to the other predators in the area, but we think this is how he got his prey and fed. This is a fossil version of the same thing and take a look at how well preserved his soft body parts are. Hallucigenia is one of the strangest looking of the Burgess Shale fossils, but an important one indeed. For years, it was thought that these things were legs right here, but they're not. Uh, fossils from China have proven that these are actually spines. My guess would be for protection and that he had uh, these uh, antennae right here that were, or tentacles for better lack of words, that were used for feeding appendages. So this guy was like a velvet worm. We think he was very similar to one of them. Anomalocarius is the most famous predator of the Burgess Shale. Why? Because he was like King Kong size compared to everybody else, and he's just a cool fossil. What's unique about them? Same kind of body plan as Opabinia in terms of the flaps on the side to allow him to propel, but he had these two large barbs that came off of his mouth area, which will be right here, and these big giant eyes on the side of his head, which gave him excellent vision for predators. So this guy is huge compared to everybody else, and if you are two centimeters big and a three foot uh, wide one of these dudes comes by, they are going to eat you for lunch. So you have to learn to take cover or find a way not to be eaten. So these guys are very important in terms of Burgess Shale fauna. This is one that's at the Smithsonian right here, a model of what they look like. They were very large creatures compared to the rest of the fauna in the area. That brings us to the late Cambrian period and we'll start with some of the famous rock deposits. Along the transcontinental arch, which are the islands that are just south of the Canadian Shield all the way down to New Mexico, we have a series of sandstone units that are famous, specifically up near the Great Lakes region called the Dells area of Wisconsin. These are mature sandstones that represented beach deposits and they are very well cross bedded as you can see right here in these sandstones right there. They're mature, so if you recall back to what mature sandstones are, they represent the actual clean quartz, meaning same size quartz grains that have been washed by beach uh, surf and have been deposited by equal size and um, pretty much pure in content except for its cementing material of calcite. We can't talk about the late Cambrian without announcing one of the most important evolutionary developments of all time. So there's a couple of places in the rock record that are extremely important in terms of evolution. One would be the arrival of the first prokaryote back in the Archean, the arrival of the first eukaryote cell, Third would be when they become complex cells. Now we know we've got diversification of shelly animals during the Cambrian explosion, and we're going to have a finale at the end of the Cambrian with the appearance of the first jawless fish. For years, the appearance of this fish was put in the Ordovician. But fossils that have been found over the years, even recently, have moved that further back in time. So we're going to look at that. These are from the late Cambrian and they're from a formation called the Deadward Formation in Wyoming. And so I've been to this area. This is not too far from the Black Hills area and these fossils are super important because this guy is unique. 
The ostracoderm is the jawless fish. So for your test purposes, we'll have when did the first jawless fish appear? The next question would be when did the first jawed fish appear? And there's specific types of jawed fish that we'll get to later in the Ordovician, Silurian, and Devonian. But for now, in the Cambrian, all we had were jawless fish. They're really kind of interesting. Their vertical scales allowed them to wiggle through the water sideways and they propelled themselves forward on the ocean floor with this process. So they would wiggle side to side kind of like this and then they would pick up small amounts of foods with their mouth that was perpetually open, I might add. I like to refer to the ostrocoderm as the ooh fish. They had this mouth that's circular and round and open, so they were sifting through detritus material looking for organic food remains that they would eat. Not the best evolutionary development and obviously not so great because they would get outcompeted by jawed fish by the Devonian or the end of the Devonian. However, this is a remarkable evolutionary development to get our first vertebrate, so let's take a look at him. These are a couple of fossils and models from the Smithsonian of uh, ostracoderms, and they come in different body plans, shapes, and sizes, but nevertheless, they are not very complex. They're very simple fishes. Here's another model from the Smithsonian giving you a look at their body plan. That's my personal ooh favorite right there. And you can see that they did not have jaws that move. So when the development of the jaws occurs, that's going to be a big deal. Now, I guess I should point out here, we would have never had jawed fish until these guys developed because the more water that came into their mouths, the more oxygen and organic material came in, ultimately leading to the development of the bones that would change and make a jaw that actually moved. So this evolutionary development is a big deal because it starts the radiation of vertebrates across the world. We know that we also find fish scales in the Cambrian, and for a long time that was why the first fish was actually put in the Ordovician because the fossils, meaning the vertebrate fossils, had not been found to go with the scales. That has since changed. So the appropriate place to put the first jawless fish is at the late Cambrian period. Trying times would conclude the late Cambrian, and here's why. As the Salk Sea was regressing off the North American Craton and other continents around the world, shallow seas that were premium real estate for animals like trilobites and brachiopods and archaeocyathids and stromatoporids and these different animals that we've been learning about today, they had nowhere to go. Their habitat would be limited. They'd be competing for food and location. So in the case of the trilobites, many of them burrowed into the mud, which is what they're capable of doing, in hopes that the water would come back, and it didn't, and they died. So we have a really great rock record of trilobites because they did this for us. I'm sad, and it's a funeral moment time because they're such a remarkable creature, and I would love to be able to go back in time and see one. So they were not the only animals that had a really tough event. Let's take a look. The late Cambrian, many people would like to call this a mass extinction, but it doesn't make the Hall of Fame for the five big mass extinctions. However, it was a very major extinction event. There are four distinctive events that occurred in the Cambrian. And so at the end of the Cambrian, we'll consider that to be the final blow. Remember, it's not a mass extinction event. It's a major extinction event. 100% of archaeocyathids went extinct. Those are those little ancient cups, right? 75% of trilobite families went extinct. That's just so sad. 50% of all sponge families went extinct. Brachiopods, gastropods, and even, I might add, mollusks took a serious hit. And it had to do with the sea level change and the lack of sea level on the continental shelves as the Salk Sea regressed. So more to come as we look at our next period in the Ordovician. Ordovician is a time of recovery after the Cambrian losses that we had at the end of the Cambrian period. Let's take a look at the things you need to be sure you know for Cambrian highlights for your test and quizzes. We know that the Cambrian is referred to as the age of the trilobites, so make sure you know that. 
make sure you know where the continental shield and transcontinental arch uh, locations are and be able to identify what type of sediments they provided around the edges like sandstones and then shales and far away from them we would have produced the carbonate rock know which sea transgressed and made its mark the sock the grand canyon has three very famous rock layers can you name them the tapete sandstone the bright angel shale and the mauve limestone we had zero mountain building events that will be a test question for sure during this period we know the Cambrian explosion occurred during the early Cambrian, and then we'd have a remarkable diversification in the middle Cambrian, marked by the Burgess Shale. The first jawless fish appears at the end of the Cambrian, the late Cambrian, and then we had four extinction events that wiped out a very important population of sea creatures, some of all of them, and then a majority of things like the trilobites. So whenever we do have a rock layer geologist that we talk about by name, like the Burgess Shale, you need to know it because it becomes important in terms of test questions. So I'm giving you a heads up on that because if I teach you about a rock layer by name, it's because it is critically important to the study of the historical geology of our region or our country. And it is something that you would learn about in any kind of geologic class. So I will see you at the next lecture. Bye.